Right, the new album, do you like it? I do. <laughs> it does feel like a reinvention for us. It feels like, you know, it's a very delicate and intimate record to listen to and to make, you know, and um, it's taken a lot to strip ourselves back, but I think we finally managed to do it. Yeah, but hold on. When I spoke to you at the Isle of Wight a couple of years ago, there was this thing about magnetic fields. This thing about <laughs> 69 songs, etc. So it's going to be 70 songs. And was there a thing where you went into the studio and said, this is what we're going to have to do? You came out with so many songs that half of them were kind of nice and acoustic or whatever, thus the current album, as opposed to the 2014 album. Well, Discuss. He kind of like, um, obviously, he kind of he'd fielded that kind of like uh, idea of uh, trying to go one song there, 70. <laughs> and uh, me and Sean look at each other it's like, as kind of wry campaign managers went, yeah, that won't happen, <laughs> kind of thing. No, so kind of, you know, kind of, but sometimes the wire tablet stone comes down, descends from the heavens, uh, plants itself in the <laughs> earth, and kind of, there's usually an element of truth in it, and we take something from it. So, you know, we've probably recorded 40 songs in the last two years. That's, that's 30 beneath 70, but, you know, <laughs> there was, yeah. we wanted it to be extensive, so that's what we took from his initial idea. So at least there was an element of a white album has to come out of this. Yeah, kind of, and yeah. then a, a, along the way, there seemed this natural split because Rewind yeah. the Film was very delicate because the, the other album we've recorded called Futurology, which hopefully is out next year, um, is much more kind of post-punk, very European. So they just, we couldn't gel them together into a white album. It was too disparate and they felt like two two really kind of solid albums in their own right. It so. didn't, yeah, it, it didn't even feel like a double album. You know, no. They felt... Yeah, I was just going to say, you couldn't have done two sides of the Manics on the... No. I don't think so. We no. tried, didn't we? And it just didn't feel... We, we sort of sequenced them and all that, and it just... It didn't feel that there was any connection lyrically either. The second album is, is more inspirational about travel and Europe and wherever you go in the world, a little story sparks yeah. off your imagination, so... But then 11 or 12 albums down the line, I mean, how do you feel about releasing albums the way you do now compared to what the way you used to do years ago? Just the way the business has changed. Is it always good to go in, do a new body of work and get it out there? Because the album is the ultimate thing that you kind of want to achieve all the time as a band. It is, yeah. You kind of like, um, you kind of, we kind of grew up, you know, completely and utterly digesting albums. Yeah. And just, you know, uh, and you knew that in like, you know, six months after you bought the album, suddenly track nine or track seven was going to be your favourite. Which and is that's the second last one on side two on yes, vinyl. Yes, yeah, it's always going to be that, you know. And so we still believe that we don't call ourselves artists, but can we, well, we do believe the album's an art form. So it's kind of, sometimes you've got you to ignore the present landscape where everything is so much more bite-sized and, you know, and this, 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 there's, there's a lack of uh, attention to detail these days, um, but you've still just got to believe in the album as the finite product of being in the band. Yeah, the funny thing is, I think even most new bands who understand the way things are done now, YouTube, and all those, even they all seem to believe in albums. Every time I talk to one, they all talk in terms of albums still. Now, having said that, there were certain songs in this thing here. For instance, there was one which you were going to give to Morrissey, and you were too scared to give to Morrissey. Well, Come on! You just didn't want that moment where you just, you've got that kind of that echo, that rerun of a film in your head where you get turned on by a girl at a disco at school. <laughs> you know, and it would have been the same moment. It would have been like, yeah, why the yeah. hell would I sing one of your songs? We just didn't want that in our memories, basically. So we bottled it, yeah. I mean, we've always prided ourselves on our duets with Ian McCulloch, on Nina Pearson, and Kylie, on this yeah. album with Kate LeBorn and Richard Hawley. And, and that was the one step too far. Is like my ultimate kind of inspiration in many ways, Morrissey. And I just, we thought, oh, we cannot face that rejection. OK, well, Kate LeBon on this album, the Four Lonely Roads track, I mean, like, do you say we need something for this? We need a female vocalist or we need Kate LeBon on something because she's so good. How does that work? There were two levels to it. I mean, kind of, um, Four Lonely Roads is written in its, in its entirety by, by Nick, the music and the lyrics. And he, when he writes, he tends to write more in the female register. Now, whilst I have a higher voice, <laughs> uh, kind of, I just, I just became aware that, you know, I've been a singer in this band for 10 albums. Yeah. And so kind of I'm thinking, let's give somebody else a chance because I know what my voice does. Um, it, may get, it, may, it may get a bit deeper with age, <laughs> um, but I just knew that there was, there was, there was a subtler angle of, you know, to the lyrics that just wasn't being explored. My voice wasn't giving some of the lyrics a chance. And, and so between those two things of him writing more of it in a female register and the lyrics just being much more gentle and much more reflective, I just thought, I don't want my voice messing these songs up. Some of them, anyway. It certainly didn't. There's a kind of conspiracy theory that was from me and Sean, but uh, James has probably done 250 manic songs, <laughs> written, yeah. released, recorded, yeah. sang. You know, I think he just got a little bit bored with his own voice. 
And the Richard Hawley connection for this album is James going to a Shirley Bassey concert. Yes. Because you've all worked with Shirley Bassey on, oh, sorry, co collaborated, worked yeah, with? Yeah, we wrote, we wrote a song for called, uh, called The Girl from Tiger Bay. Yeah. And I'm all, I met Richard Hawley at, at the Roundhouse in London for ele BBC Electric Proms. And uh, yeah, I, I don't really get on with musicians that much, but I really bonded with him. Uh, we, we bonded over kind of love of the place we came from, whether it be Sheffield or Wales. Yeah. And um, we kind of bonded about our dads kind of being the same kind of hard bitten, but kind of a uh, principled characters from the same kind of backgrounds. Ted's. So, Ted's Bikers yeah. and Ted's. Bikers who'd been in a lot of kind of like uh, in, in chain fights and stuff like that. <laughs> so I really got on with him. And, um, and again, Nick had started off the verses for Rewind the Film and he just needed that low kind of yeah. voice that was facing the abyss. And my voice doesn't do that abyss, abyss looking into the abyss kind of thing. So he just seemed like the obvious choice, and he, he came down and he did it in like two, three takes, which was kind of depressing for me as a vocalist, because <laughs> I usually take about four or five takes. But. Okay, but even in a throwaway way, the one of the first things you said here was, yes, it is a new chapter or whatever of Manic Street Preachers. In some ways, the postcards from a young man and the more recent journal album from like whatever, the, like was that the close of something? Because you yeah. did say some kind of, I don't know what the quote was exactly. So like, this is our last shot of mass communication yeah. kind of thing. Because you know the way the industry is changing and you've got to kind of go along on this road now as opposed to this. With all due respect, there's not going to be 20 pages of generation terrorists and the enemy kind of thing. Those days are kind of gone. Yeah. So it's a different way now. Yeah. And do you see it there for as a part? God, there was a question there. Yeah, no, <laughs> yes, you have got to navigate yourself yeah. through a different path, undoubtedly. Yeah, and um, exactly. postcards especially was... I kind of clicked and it worked. It was our last real shot at it and, you know, it sold really well. But it was a bit of a last hurrah. We put every bit of anthemic melody we could into that. Right. And we realised three years on what, again. Jeremy, like, oh, no, the, the postcards. We yeah, it was really, you know, us being our, our biggest version of ourselves in a lot of ways, our most anthemic version of ourselves. And uh, there's only so much you can do of that without boring yourselves and your audience. But then again, there is like yin and yang to me and him. Sometimes he'll he'll try and navigate down the mountain safely, and I'll still be thinking, but if I could write, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. if I could write a song as good as Since You've Been Gone by Rainbow, <laughs> but with our lyrics, we can still do it. So you know, this this a little eternal struggle in there. I guess covered on glee. Well, and things yeah. there are things you can do. For instance, you like rugby, so hey, I'll tell you what, we'll do some dates while the Lions are touring Australia. Now you know that's not many bands can do that. Oh, it was well, uh, just a trip of a lifetime from start to finish. You know, we've just been in the hotel with the players. We also hopped over to New Zealand because we'd never played a gig in New Zealand. Right. Did a great show there. Watched the last two tests. Met James Bond. Had a coffee with him. Happened <laughs> because he was in the same hotel. Jamie Roberts on stage with us. It was just magnificent. And it's good to do that because we are so intense about music. It is nice just to have a b bit of a break from it. Okay, really. well, look, just before we finish, just one thing about this current album, just to get back to it. You mentioned something about like the fact that it's possibly your most emotionally raw album in one way. Yeah. Now you'd say that because yeah, there's hardly electric guitar anywhere, and there will be in 2014. But it, is it because of the songwriting, or is it because of the lack of noise? I think it's it is dictated by the lyrics. I mean, it is an album inspired by R. S. Thomas and poetry, and looking in the mirror and thinking, how can you sustain that delusion of being young and the delusion of rock and roll? And you know, it's very it's a very kind of Welsh self-critical examination of the self um which i guess maybe some sort of middle age thing involved in that as well much as i am still absolutely in love with the band and the delusion yeah. of rock and roll it's just hard to sustain it sometimes it's, yeah. absolutely and like it's like the amount of people who wouldn't admit to that yeah it's exactly. stupid yeah. Yeah, so there's a weird thing that happens in, you know in in a band, you know, once you get past your tenth album, yeah. the symbolism of the no, I mean, whether it be like you know the, the number ten jersey in rugby, you know, yeah. the number ten jersey in football, even yeah. Yeah. you know the classic number ten and your tenth album, it just seems to just it's a little Listen, time set. Even the Rolling head. Stones have stopped singing "Good Morning Little Schoolgirls," so it's okay. I think Steel Wheels was the eleventh album, so we're we're, we're, we're mixed emotions. Was well, so I'm happy with that? Happy with that? Okay, but listen, that's the final one, just about Wales. That question I wanted to ask, um, Wales. Everybody knew years ago that like Manic Street Preachers were a Welsh band, were from Wales, everything else, every single thing about it, if you tolerate this, right through, etc. Yeah. But does Wales still shape the songs of Manic Street Preachers? Only because it's where we come from, yeah. I think. Right. You know, I mean, I, I think, you know, just, it's, yeah, it's been an education being with Richard Orley, you know, because, you know, Sheffield still yeah. informs everything Everybody he's ever done, you know? Okay. So yeah. kind of, um, but other bands follow different routes. Sometimes they want to divorce themselves from the world of reality and create a fantastic new world of their own. And they follow that, that, that path and they've become disconnected from anything they ever were. We're just not that band.
Okay. I mean, I'm constantly kind of inspired by the idea of trying to put something back into where I come from. Lyrically, emotionally, whatever, you know. It's not like soapboxing or anything. It's just something kind of deep, some deep connection into my heart, into the messed up melancholy of Wales. We do feel, we do feel privileged as, as we have that serendipitous moment where we all found each other as friends and then we became, became yeah. a band. And kind of like, um, and we just feel as if the place, you know, especially the valleys in Wales, just sure. completely and utterly nourished us, you know, but in a in very unexpected feral ways. Feral way. In a feral, in a feral way. way. Yeah. And rewind the film too, the noisier version 2014, when might that be? I think April, May. Hopefully it's kind of working titles, Futurology. Futurology. Yeah. All right, thank you very much, guys, for talking to us. Good luck. It's always Pleasure. a pleasure.